She was called the Lonely Queen of the North. At the height of World War II, Winston Churchill had a personal interest, nay, an obsession in finding her. The British Prime Minister was on the hunt for the pride of the Kriegsmarine, the German Navy, the battleship Tirpitz. As he wrote to the First Sea Lord, Sir Dudley Pounds, the crippling of this ship would alter the entire face of the naval war. The loss of a hundred machines or five hundred airmen would be well compensated for. The Royal Navy, the RAF, and the Combined Operations Group were all unleashed in her pursuit. Through a variety of methods and tactics, they all had a common objective – to sink the Tirpitz. Now, before we get into the story of how the British military hunted down the Tirpitz, let's get to know her. The Tirpitz was the second and last battleship of the Bismarck class to be deployed. She was the largest naval vessel built in Germany and the heaviest battleship ever constructed by a European Navy. Building took place between June 1936 and March 1939 at Wilhelmshaven Shipyard, and the Tirpitz was eventually commissioned on the 25th of February 1941. The terms sea monster and Leviathan are more often invoked when referring to large warships, and the Tirpitz surely deserved such titles. She was 250 meters long, and at full load, it displaced more than 53,000 metric tons. Much of that weight could be ascribed to her heavy armor, which could be as thick as 320 millimeters. Even its upper deck was protected by an armor between half a centimeter and 80 millimeters thick. Such a heavy beast needed some serious power to move around. In the case of the Tirpitz, she was propelled by 12 boilers and three turbine sets, packing more than 163,000 horsepower. When it came to armament, she could deploy an impressive amount of firepower from her 72 guns of various calibers and eight torpedo tubes. The crew of 2,608 officers and sailors would have been made aware of incoming threats by its three radar antennae and four spotter seaplanes. No wonder then that Churchill dubbed her the Beast and sought to have her slain from the very start. Even before the date of commissioning, 15 British bombing raids tried to destroy the battleship while it was still in the dockyard, and immediately after February 1941, two further raids tried to accomplish that enterprise. But in all cases, the Tirpitz only reported minor damage. Her sister ship, the battleship Bismarck, was not so lucky, though. On the 27th of May 1941, she was scuttled by her captain after suffering crippling hits from the Royal Navy and its fleet air arm, or FAA, in the North Atlantic. Admiral Eric Rader, commander-in-chief of the German Navy, was wary of losing the second jewel of his crown, and so he ordered to dispatch the Tirpitz to Norway. There she could pose a threat to Allied convoys supplying the USSR via the Arctic Sea. More importantly, her role would be to act as a fleet in being. In other words, even if the Tirpitz never left port, the Allies would be forced to invest precious resources in keeping it under control. And so, on the 14th of January 1942, Captain Karl Topp ordered the crew of the Tirpitz to set sail for Trondheim, Norway, with an escort of four destroyers. The British military had intercepted and decoded the Enigma encrypted communications about the relocation of the Tirpitz, but the Royal Air Force, the RAF, was stumped by foul weather and had to postpone the attacks. On the 16th of January, the Tirpitz moored in the Fjarten Ford, just north of Trondheim, where she was protected by anti-aircraft batteries and torpedo nets. Her most effective protective measure, however, was beyond the control of Captain Top and the RAF. Again, it was bad weather. On the 30th and 31st of January 1942, the RAF Bomber Command conducted Operation Oil. 16 Stirling and Halifax bombers took off from Scotland, ready to deliver a deadly payload upon the beast. But due to poor weather conditions and scarce visibility, the pilots failed to locate the battleship and flew back to base. On the 9th of March, the Tirpitz left for Chart and Ford to attack PQ-12, a supply convoy headed toward the Soviet Union. The mission was a fiasco as the battleship failed to intercept it. Upon returning to her base, the beast was targeted by 12 FAA torpedo bombers dispatched from the HMS Victorious. It was the first proper duel between Tirpitz and the Royal Navy, and Captain Top came. Well, he came out on top. None of the torpedoes launched by the FAA bombers managed to score a hit, while the Tirpitz's anti aircraft batteries shot down two planes. And so the game was on. More and more swarms of bombers would return to rain down fire on the beast. Would she be? So lucky the next time. Well, as it would turn out, yeah, she would. Between the 30th of March and the 29th of April 1942, the RAF launched three further raids on Fajart and Ford, involving a total of 85 Halifax and 22 Lancaster bombers. None of these missions succeeded in inflicting significant damage, and the Bomber Command lost 13 planes in total. Once more, Top had weather on his side, with thick clouds and ground-level mist hindering the accuracy of the bombers. 
Thus far, it may appear as though the beast of the Kriegsmarine was protected by a double whammy of sheer luck and allied incompetence, but that would be an unfair judgment. On the 28th of March 1942, just before the last run of failed missions, the Brits had accomplished one of the most spectacular special forces raids ever in their quest to neutralize the tear pits. That was Operation Chariot. So let's explain. In early 1942, the Royal Navy still feared that the Tirpitz could venture into the North Atlantic, thus disrupting precious Allied supply from North America. The planning division within the Admiralty reasoned that for the battleship to be deployed effectively in the Battle of the Atlantic, it required appropriate dry dock facilities on the Atlantic coast. Then the only suitable port for the job was Saint Nazaire on the French coast. The Germans fully realized its importance, concentrating strong defensive facilities around it. Captain Charles Lamb started formulating a plan. How about blowing up the lock gate at the entrance of St. Nazaire so as to render the dry dock impossible to use? This uh, move would have effectively pinned down the tear pits within the confines of the Arctic. Lamb shared his idea with Lord Mountbatten, head of the Combined Operations Headquarters, in charge of launching amphibious raids against the Axis on the European continent. Mountbatten and his men firmed up an audacious plan. A naval vessel packed with explosives would ram into the outer lock gate. Once stuck there, a massive explosion would blow up the outer gate. Next, it was time to destroy the inner gate, courtesy of a motor torpedo boat, firing specially designed delayed action torpedoes. Finally, commandos would move in to destroy as many moored vessels as possible before escaping on motor launches. On the 26th of March, 1942, Operation Chariot was a go. A small fleet launched from Falmouth, headed by a motor gun boat, followed by three destroyers and 14 motor launches. One of the destroyers was actually an American vessel, USS Buchanan. Rechristened the HMS Campbell Town, she would have the honor of slamming into the gates of St. Nazir. After falling a German submarine and five torpedo boats, the raiders approached the theater of action on the night between the 27th and the 28th of March. A diversionary RAF bomber raid struck St. Nazaire around midnight, setting the scene for the entrance of the main cast, brightly illuminated by the German searchlights. But the vessels of the commando were all flying flags of the Reich, which left the defenders puzzled long enough for other raiders to approach the outer gate. Eventually, the Germans opened fire, killing or wounding half of the commandos aboard the motor launches, only two of the smaller craft managed to land at their assigned positions. But the star of the show was the HMS Campbelltown. At 1.34 a.m., the destroyer rammed into the dock gates. Shortly afterwards, the motor torpedo boat deployed its delayed action ammunition. After minutes of heavy fighting on the shore, the commanding officer, Captain Ryder, ordered a withdrawal. His commandos had suffered heavy losses while fighting at St. Nazir and would suffer even more on the return journey. The small fleet was attacked both by shore batteries and German torpedo boats, and only four out of the 18 vessels made it back home. Of the 241 commandos involved, 59 were killed or missing in action, while 109 were taken prisoner. The Royal Navy lost 85 sailors killed or missing, whilst 20 were captured. But the raid was not over yet. Later that day at noon, 40 German officers were inspecting the Campbelltown, firmly lodged into the entrance of their precious dock. And that's when the explosives on board detonated. A massive blast killed all the officers on board, plus some 400 soldiers on the keep. The following day, the 29th of March, the delayed action torpedoes also went off, destroying the inner port gates. For the remainder of the war, St. Nazaire would never service the tear pits, nor any other vessel, for that matter. With St. Nazaire destroyed, the tear pits had no chance to stalk the Atlantic, but she could wreak havoc in the Arctic. On the 2nd of July, the battleship left Trondheim, escorted by a heavy cruiser, four destroyers, and two torpedo boats. On the 4th, the battle group joined up with two more heavy cruisers and five destroyers. While on maneuvers, four destroyers ran onto rocks and were left behind. But the remaining vessels were enough to launch their mission. Operation Rosa Sprung, or Night's Move. Their objective? Attacking the 36 freighters of supply convoy PQ-17 headed to the Soviet Union. As the battle group approached its prey, British military intelligence picked up their communications and alerted PQ-17, ordering the convoy to scatter. The German Admiralty, weary of losing the Tirpitz in a fight against the Allied escort ships, ordered the beast to moor in the safety of Bogen Bay near Narvik in Norway. The action was concluded by the 8th of July. Apparently, the Tirpitz had done little but show up, take a look around, and then retreat. Veni, vidi, deseishi. I came, I saw, I left. But the mere fear of her presence had left the scattered PQ-17 without escorts, at the mercy of the U-boats and of the Luftwaffe. Twenty-two out of thirty-four merchantmen were lost 
in a matter of hours. After some weeks in Bogan on the 23rd of October, the Tirpitz sailed south back to Trondheim. Unbeknownst to Top and his crew, the British and the Norwegian resistance were plotting a daring raid. Operation Title. Back on the 19th of December 1941, Italian frogmen of their Navy Special Forces had sunk two British battleships in the port of Alexandria, Egypt, with an innovative tactic. Three manned torpedoes had infiltrated the harbor at night and placed explosives under the ship's hulls. We have a video about the Italian Navy raids, by the way, so do check it out. Inspired by their successes, the Royal Navy had developed their own manned torpedoes, the Chariots. A Norwegian fishing vessel charged with towing the Chariots towards Trondheim unfortunately sailed into terrible weather, losing her secret weapons along the way. After yet another fiasco, the Tirpitz went through a period of relative quiet, while Churchill was fuming back in Whitehall. It's a terrible thing that this prize should be waiting and no one be able to think of a way of winning it. During March, his coveted prize was relocated further north to Alterford. She was also placed under command of a new captain, Hans Meyer. On the 6th of September 1943, Meyer and crew saw some serious action. As part of Operation Sicilian, at the head of a large battle group, Tirpitz sailed towards the island of Spitsbergen in the Svalbard archipelago, home to a British refueling station. On the 8th, the Tirpitz fired a total of 134 rounds, destroying the port facilities whilst German troops disembarked and completed the job. By the 9th, the beast had returned to its lair in Alterford. After the failure of Operation Title, Winston Churchill was still of the idea that the Tirpitz could have been disposed of the Italian way, as he declared, It seems very discreditable that the Italians should show themselves so much better at attacking ships in harbour than we do. But the Admiralty had a plan to prove him wrong. Operation Source, a raid in Altafor to be carried out by X-Crafts. These were mini-submarines, 51 feet or 15 meters in length, manned by a crew of four. Once an X-Craft had approached its target, it would release two devices carrying a total of four tons of Amatol, a TNT-based explosive. The bombs would fall to the sea bottom and then go off at a pre-established time. On the 11th of September, six conventional submarines left Scotland, each with an X-Craft in tow. X-5, X-6, and X-7 were assigned to attack the Tirpitz. X-8 was to blow the heavy cruiser Ludzo, and X-9 and X-10 would sink the battleship Scharnhorst. While on transit, X-9 was lost at sea, and X-8 suffered mechanical failure, but the remaining X-Crafts pressed on. On the 20th, also X-10 experienced mechanical issues. It was now a duel between X's 5, 6, and 7, and the Tirpitz. Just before dawn on the 22nd, one of the anti-submarine nets protecting Alterford was opened to let a small German vessel through. Lieutenant Cameron, in charge of X-6, seized the opportunity and slipped through. As his periscope didn't work, Cameron had to emerge briefly, and he was seen by German guards. Undeterred, he sailed his mini-sub under the Tirpitz and released his charges. Knowing that escape was futile, Cameron and his crew scuttled the X-6 and surrendered. They were taken aboard the Tirpitz for interrogation, but refused to say a word. Well, that was except for Cameron's deputy, Sub-Lieutenant Lorimer. When he saw German divers getting ready to inspect the Tirpitz hull, he warned them not to, or else they'd be mashed potato. In the meanwhile, X-7, led by Lieutenant Place, had also laid out its bombs. But on the way out, the craft got entangled in a submarine net. At exactly 8.12 hours, the four charges detonated. Eight tons of Amatol blasted gaping holes in the hull of the Tirpitz, tearing through its fuel tanks and flooding several compartments. The shockwaves from the explosion freed X-7 from the nets, but it was too damaged to make an escape. Two crew members died inside the wreck, while Place and another sailor were taken prisoner. As per X-5, the blast caused it to surface. It was soon spotted and sunk with depth charges. Cameron and Place had proved to be as good as the Italians when it came to laying mines under a battleship, and for their daring efforts, they were awarded the Victoria Cross. But the beast had only been wounded. Sure, it wouldn't be fully repaired until April 1944, but it still posed a threat. The hunt was still on. Already in March 1944, British naval intelligence estimated the Tirpitz was capable of 18 knots. This was enough to cause trouble. The Royal Navy responded with Operation Tungsten. On the 3rd of April, six aircraft carriers released a swarm of 42 dive bombers and 51 fighters. And this time, luck and good weather were on their side. The bombers caught the Tirpitz just as she was maneuvering out of her safe haven. A deluge of bombs weighing up to 1,600 pounds or 726 kilos dove upon the beast, scoring 14 hits. Two gun turrets were destroyed. The spotter planes were burned down, and the crew suffered 438 casualties, of which 122 were killed in action. It was a success, but not THE success the Navy and its fleet air arm were after. None of the bombs had managed to penetrate the armored deck of the battleship. The FAA went at it four more times using similar formations of up to 44 Barracudas with a fighter escort. 
These attacks took place between the 17th of July and the 29th of August, but only achieved limited results. The new captain of the Tear Pits, Wolf Young, could now rely on the advanced Funkmess Autung 26 radar equipment, making him well aware in advance of the incoming Barracudas. By deploying a thick smokescreen, the Germans could effectively hinder the accuracy of the bombers. Only the raid on the 24th of August managed to score a clean hit. A 1,600-pound bomb did pierce the main deck, but it didn't explode. So there was the crux of the problem. Using a bomb powerful enough and reliable enough to penetrate cleanly through the armored deck and then either explode or continue its descent and pierce the hull underneath. The answer to the dilemma came from inventor Barnes Wallace and his recently designed Tall Boys bombs. Once dropped from a plane, they accelerated to incredibly high speeds thanks to their streamlined shape and tail fins. Their massive weight, 12,000 pounds or 5.4 metric tons, ensured that no armored ship decks could resist. The Tall Boys would be put to the test in Operation Paravane, a raid of Lancaster bombers mounted by the RAF. Some of these bombers and crew came from 617 Squadron, known as the Dam Busters. Yep, the same guys from the 1955 war movie. More importantly, it was the same squadron who had destroyed two German dams in May of 1943 using special bouncing bombs created by, well, yes, guess who? It was Barnes Wallace again. The Dam Busters and their compatriots from 9th Squadron left at Lossmouth in Scotland on the 11th of September 1944, heading toward Archangel in northwestern Russia. On the 15th, 28 Lancasters left the Russian base and set course to Alterford. But the Lonely Queen of the North, as Tirpitz was known to Norwegians, wanted to prove once more that it wasn't easy prey. Once again, the German radar equipment gave Captain Jung sufficient notice, and he laid out a thick cloud of smoke to shroud his ship from view. And when the RAF bombers showed up, her anti-aircraft guns erupted in a hail of fire. With such defenses, the Lancasters were able to hit the Queen only twice. But they hit her hard. The two tall boys pierced through the ship's stern, right to the bottom of the fort. The subsequent explosions damaged extensively the tear pits' engines and gunnery control systems. Captain Jung and his superiors realized that the tear pits had been crippled so badly it was barely seaworthy. Its only possible use was to relocate it to the island of Hakoi near Tromso to be used as a floating artillery battery against a very likely Allied invasion of Norway. This was a bad move, as Tromso was within flying range from RAF bases in Scotland. In fact, the bombers from 617 and 9 Squadron returned on the 29th of October, but low, thick clouds over Hakoi forced them to to return to base. Barely a week after the aborted operation, the Tirpitz was assigned a new captain, Robert Weber. It's always difficult to be the new guy on a job with immense responsibilities, especially if a bunch of Brits with hugely powerful bombs are about to blow up your place of work. On the 12th of November at 9.35 a.m., 31 Lancasters appeared in the clear skies over Tromso. This was Operation Catechism. Captain Weber welcomed the dam busters and friends with a barrage of anti-aircraft fire, but it appeared as though the Queen of the North had finally run out of luck. A tall boy bomb struck the tear pits between two of the main gun turrets, but it failed to explode. A second bomb did explode, though, hitting the vessel right through the middle. It tore large holes through the bottom and the hull on the port side. A third tall boy missed its target, but the blast managed to cause serious damage to the hull anyhow. Weber realized that his queen, his beast, had been mortally wounded and ordered the crew to evacuate. At 9.50, the tear pits was listing at a 60-degree angle. Two minutes later, it had capsized. Captain Weber, as per tradition, went down with his ship. Further, 970 sailors and officers would die that morning, trapped inside the wreck of the tear pits. The Allied Ahabs had finally pierced the heart of their Moby Dick. Now, we'd like to conclude this story with a provocative thought. Was the victory actually on the Allied side in this case? The strategy of German Admiral Erich Rader had been to use the Tirpitz as a fleet in being. By her sheer presence, the Allies would be forced to invest valuable resources and manpower to keep her under tabs or to take her out. And this is exactly what happened. Throughout her career, Tirpitz only participated in three operations. The first sortie against a supply convoy, which she failed to locate. A second sortie against another convoy, which was cut short before she could engage, although her mere presence eventually led to the sinking of 22 cargo ships. And Operation Sicilian, the only occasion in which she successfully shelled a target. Overall, the actual damage inflicted by the beast was pretty limited, and yet it had prompted the British to launch a total of 35 aerial, naval, and combined operations and to commit precious resources and manpower sorely needed elsewhere for a period of almost five years. So let us know your thoughts in the comments. Did the beast never live up to her full potential, or did the Queen of the North fully deliver against her objectives? <laughs>